Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Happy Sunday. Um, I just wanted to say that all of us here at IPS are extremely grateful that you could join us for the last day of the Ideas into Action Festival. Um, it's a very celebratory time for all of us. Um, and it's wonderful to have so many of our friends, allies, and family members here. Um, I also like to welcome you to a very special conversation between two great authors and activists. Um, writing along the intersections of the personal and the political, Ariel Dorfman and E. Ethelbert Miller have powerfully expressed the truths of their experience through their memoirs and their poetry, helping to shed light to the triumphs and the struggles um, of our common humanity. Uh, between them, I could go on and on about all of the things that they have written. <laughs> we have um, E. Ethelbert Miller, who has written two memoirs, um, one called Fathering Words, The Making of an African American Writer, and the other most recent, The Fifth Inning. Um, and Ariel Dorfman has written um, extensively about his experiences um, as an exile from Chile. And um, his first memoir is Heading South, Looking North, A Bilingual Journey, and most recently, uh, Feeding on Dreams, Confessions of an Unrepentant Exile. Um, both of them have also written poetry, um, essays, um, and Ariel Dorfman is also known as uh, a prolific playwright, uh, and E. Ethelbert Miller is the host of a television show called The Scholars. Um, so uh, I'd like to say that today we'll have two friends speaking uh, with each other about their experiences on transformation, individual self-transformation, and um, an examination of their lives, however impacted by the injustices and inequities um, of society. And I hope that all of us here today will be able to walk away with inspiration. Um, for, in looking for a way to uncover the truths um, for themselves and, of course, for a better world. Um, so today, I'm going to do this slightly differently. Um, I'm going to step away to allow the two to speak very candidly and freely um, for the next hour and a half. And uh, again, I'm glad that you can join us today. Uh, without Further ado, I welcome Ariel Dorfman and Ethelbert Miller for our conversation today on the role of artists in social change. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've always wanted to sit down with Ariel. I, I really wanted to be more of an interviewer as opposed to just, you know, being a conversation. But I thought that what we would do uh, is talk about language, uh, talk about poetry, also talk about memoir, uh, read excerpts of our work. Uh, but I thought it would be good um, to begin with some very general um, questions, um, because I admire how you think. So I, I, I developed a couple of questions that I think would really be uh, wonderful for our audience to hear you respond to. And the first question is, does the oppressor and the oppressed always speak a common language? Is it the language of violence? In times of protests, should social movements attempt to reinvent language in order to break free of the past and imagine a new world? That's not a trick question. <laughs> so let me start by, by, being, by answering that in a very simple way. But first, let me take a detour, which is always what one should do, and say that it is very, very wonderful for my wife, Angelic, and myself to be here today. Because many years ago, we came to Washington, D.C., ostensibly for a year, uh, to go on to Mexico so we could continue with our language, which was Spanish, and bring our boys up in that language. And we got stuck here because the Mexican government decided, uh, the person who was bringing us to Mexico decided that he was going to he was going to expose the corruption of the Mexican government in Pemex. So, 
What happened was that we got stuck here, you know, and then when we were stuck here, of course, before we were stuck here, we already knew the IPS, we were with them all the time, but mm -hmm. when we were stuck here, IPS took us in. They took us in, they, they, they saved us, they gave us a refuge, and uh, we already were in contact with the Transnational Institute, we, in other words, we, we had contacts with them, but this became our home and this is our family, and, and yesterday with Angelica, you know, seeing all our old friends and seeing our new friends and, and feeling that this was our home in, in many senses, it's just something I want to say, mm -hmm. it's very important, meaning, uh, this is one of our homes, our, our dear homes. Another of the homes is language. Mm -hmm. So yeah. let me, with that I can segue sure. into, your, into your question. So, uh, <laughs> detour into my here's, question. Here, here, <laughs> I, I think it's a trick question in, in two senses. In one sense, of course, oppressed and oppressed have very different languages because they speak from different parts of the divide. The dream of the world that they have, and therefore the dream of the language that they're working, the, how they dream the language of everyday life, is considerably different, right? Meaning that the discourse of a George W. Bush or of a Abu uh, Salvador Allende, they're very different, right? They speak in different ways. Would that it would be so easy, right? And the play that has made me most famous was Death and the Maiden, speaks to the fact that the person who tortured Paulina for all those months and raped her, shares a love for Schubert. And I've always told the story of, of, of how difficult it was for me to organize, you know, Death and the Maiden, the quartet of, of Schubert. And this was what this, this horrible person played, this doctor played for her as he tried to grab, to, to, to find a common ground with her. And I've always shared, I've always shared the, the um, I've always told the story, in, in the memoir that you mentioned, Feeding on Dreams, I, I told the story of how I was in Paris and my, 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 my mother-in-law, Angelica's uh, mother, would send me these, uh, these magazines from, 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 from Santiago and I would read them. Even, I, would, even, even the, I would even read the advertisements because I was so mm. desperate to get back in some way. I mean, you know, read what, what they were selling. What, what, what the real estate was like, just to yeah. feel that you were there, you know, make believe that. And then there was, there was, an, there was an interview with, with um, Gustavo Lee, who was the, the head of the, the Air Force, who had created, the, because they were more sophisticated, they were much more intelligent than the Army people, he had created the most sophisticated uh, intelligence service that was responsible for the personal deaths of several of my friends. He was, it was a, an extraordinarily uh, horrible service, but very, very intelligent. It was, it was the only one, it was intelligence and intelligence service, you don't always bring those things together. And, <laughs> and he, he uh, and towards the end of the interview with him in the Revista Silla, uh, they asked him about what he really liked, and he said, I love Beethoven, you know, I love Beethoven, I love the late quartets of Beethoven. And I grabbed the magazine and I threw it to the ground and I stomped in it, you know, and I said, that's ese hijo de puta no, impossible. Eh? That son of a bitch, he can't possibly love Beethoven. <laughs> and I can remember, and, and Jelly remembers this as well, you know, how, how the, the, the light in Paris began to go down with that, that little sort of gray, impressionistic way it, well, it, that it does. You know, the, the light in Paris is very, very special. And as it grew darker, I just began to think about it, and I looked down on the ground at this thing, and I picked, up this, I picked it up and I said, you know what, it's much more interesting if he does love Beethoven. Mm -hmm. It's much more, I mean, you know, life is much more complex if he loves Beethoven. Because if he, if he, if he, if he loves Beethoven, then I've got a problem. If he doesn't love Beethoven, then it's very simple. You know, you, you separate them between the good and the bad, but it turns out that there is the beauty in the middle, and, and does he, it's the old question about the Nazis and, and you know, and Goethe and all. But it, it's a very, very central question right. for a writer in particular, because in writing, as you know very well, you don't start out by knowing the truth. Mm -hmm. You start out by not knowing the truth and trying to figure it out. One of the reasons why uh, right wing, the right wing does, tends not to have very good writers is because they think that they know ahead of time what's, what, what the result is. Right. They, get, they get a character, you know, and they, they, they know what the character's gonna be. The, the bad literature, literature you can't read over and over again, is literature which is determined ahead of time. Well, how do we create, use our imagination so, to create the literature for the new world? So that, that, that's the point, is that, that you share a language with, with these oppressors, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <clears throat> 
you, you share you share certain forms of language with them. Uh, in other sense, senses, you don't. But uh, you work with. You know, I, I don't think it's only a problem of oppressed or an oppressed, okay. because I think most of the people are, are, most of the readers are certainly somewhere in between. So you want to change the equation? Uh, what, what I want to do is, uh, I always think the triangles are much more interesting than, than bipolar things. So, I mean, the, so does Hollywood. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's uh, the basic uh, triangle. Right. No, no, but, no, but it's, it's, break, it's breaking out of the, 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 the binary duality. idea, the duality, the idea that things are like this or like right. that, you know? That there are ways you th synthesize. It's the way you complicate things. And sure. you know, if you're you're a good writer, and I hope we are, you know, you try to complicate things in that sense. Right. Now, later on, I'm going to mention some of the the poems that I wrote about from the other side of death. And one of those poems is William Blake writing to Laura Bush, lover of literature, from the other side of death, mm -hmm. so that she could convince <laughs> her husband from with Francisco Petrarco had his own Laura, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all about that. It's all about finding those moments. Now, r relating to, to, to what you're asking about, about changing, so you want to write in such a way that you are, com you are, you are understood by as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure at the same time that you're renovating the language so you're not understood immediately. So you're breaking down barriers from the past. Let's give people and oppressors will not right. do that. Let's give people, you have a poem for Angelica that you could read, and then I'll read a poem. OK, I was going to do this at the end, but I, I'd rather do this. This is the latest lo lo thing. Love should be at the beginning. Yeah? Oh, uh, uh, love should always be at the beginning <laughs> and the bottom of it. No, <laughs> lately, lately, I mean, one of the things we have to say about this is the following, OK? Ernesto Cardenal says, the constitutions of tomorrow will be written with the love poems of today. And this is something I repeat over and over again. I repeat it so often, people say, we love what you say. I said, no, it's not me. No, 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 what you said. But anyway, so lately in the last, I, I think everything has always been a love poem to my wife, always. But lately, it's been very, very specific as we have been, uh, I would say, we've been, we've been working through the residues of the contamination left by so many years of exile and so many years of struggle. It's been, it's been difficult. It's not easy, you know? It's not easy because when you fight for so many years against really, really, I mean, these people are, are really bad people. They're very human, okay? When you do that, there are ways in which you become contaminated. The whole society, in the case of Chile, becomes contaminated. Mm -hmm. The same in the United States, you can see that as well, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're still living under the, the, the influence of Reagan's extraordinarily uh, perverse influence on the society, right? And it come, came from before as well. So one of the things I've been doing is I, I, I've, been, I've been spending time on the most political thing I can do, which is these love poems. Or the, it's not really a love poem. This is a prose poem. It's very, very short. It's relatively short. But as you say, I, I, think, I think it's worth opening with this. I thought I was going to close with it, but you're right, Ethelbert. <laughs> And then you're, 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 you can read. Okay. This is called, it's a, a prose poem or something like that. It's a little tiny short story like that. It's called Ashes to Ashes. He had said he would love her beyond death, but she didn't believe him. I knew it wasn't true, her ashes said to her or to what was left to her. Or maybe she was the one who, a bit sadly and dispersed, whispered the words of the residue and sift of her life as it was carefully poured into a jar where her husband's remains according to both their wills and wishes, had been waiting for 10 years now. But part of me, said the dust unto dust she was on her way to becoming, wanted it to be true. And then someone on earth, someone of flesh and blood, perhaps a relative, perhaps a friend, perhaps just an employee eager to go off and drink some coffee, someone she no longer remembered, clamped the jar shut and told darkness settled in. She didn't have time to be afraid. From somewhere nearby, she felt, but how could she feel anything if she was dead? She felt a hand in her hand. But her hand had been burnt to cinders and scraped past recognition. She felt a hand in her incinerated hand and the whorl, uh, uh, incinerated hand and skin, and the whorls of her fingerprints and the world at her fingertips. Let me repeat what she felt and insisted was a hand that reached out to her from the middle of the end of the end. And another hand began to soften towards what was once her face and no longer existed, blurted out of nothingness and memory, 
Let me insist that the fingers she had once known and cooked for and entwined with were breathing music into her lips and reminding her hair what it was like to be recollected in tranquility. And a leg was rubbing unmistakably against her leg. And she could smell him again in the night. And he was like a wind, as was she, blowing from inside eternity. And she knew as her shoulders and back and full breasts knew as they began to grow. She knew as the birds of her eyes knew as they began to scatter towards the light. She knew that she was not alone. They embraced. They embraced and she knew. She knew that he had not lied. She knew that I was telling the truth when I promised that I would love her beyond death. Mm. Mm. So, mi amor es para ti eso, eh? my love, not for you. I'm going to um, read this poem um, entitled, My Lebanon, My Love. Uh, it's for my friend, Hin Shivani, uh, Palestinian poet and filmmaker. Uh, we correspond quite frequently by email. And in one of her emails, she wrote, war surrounds us, but I'm taking the day off. <laughs> I had to put that in a poem. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful Beirut, please tell me someone overslept and a bomb did not explode today. Tell me the smoke is not my lover's perfume. Let us sit in cafes with tea, coffee, and conversations. I want to say hello to a woman's lips. Is that a comma near her legs, my period near her breasts? Did you know beauty is now a refugee? Desire said, I would never see home again. Hin, is this true? Does war now surround our hearts? Or is it simply the loneliness that sleeps with separation? I miss you. I miss love and peace. I wanted, um, I wanted to um, follow these Beauty is now a refugee. <laughs> right. Wow, well, yes, that's true. Right. I wanted to follow this up with something that you said about poetry. You said, um, if a poem cannot speak for itself, it has failed. Yes. That's why we shouldn't explain it. <laughs> I can remember once when, when uh, Grace Paley took me to a, a, a class of hers in, in some s school. They were, they, were, they were some young kids. And, 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 and they, uh, they read it. Uh, one of the students took a piece of Widows, one of my novels, and, and, and said, Mr. Dorfman, what do you mean by that? And I took, I took the, I took the uh, piece and I reread the whole thing. And I said, this is what I meant by it. <laughs> exactly that. You know. right. So I think that's, that's right. really true. Right. Uh, I mean, you can have explanations about it. You mm -hmm. can even intellectualize a little bit about it. But it either goes to your heart and moves you in very different ways, especially if it asks questions, you know? So, you know, you, 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 you really want the readers to be co-writers with you, and they are. Once, once you've completed the poem, it's there, or the, the, the novel or whatever. It's there, it belongs, it belongs to other people, it doesn't belong to you. As long as you've done your work well, then they will find, they will all find different interpretations. People say the <laughs> strangest things, I mean. Well, let me tell something from you, yeah. and, and um, this was a deep influence that you had on my work. I know you do a lot of cross-cultural stuff, but you have two poems. One, um, I mean, maybe you'll read these poems too. Last Will and Testament. Yes. And Two Times Two. Yes. And, and when I heard those poems, um, it's around the time I met you. Yes. Those poems stood in my head. I hope you read them. But to show you what I just discovered, um, before I heard your work, the person who was an influence on me was Sterling Brown. And really? when I read your work and heard those poems, um, Last Will and Testament and Two Times Two, uh, which I hope you'll share, oh. I'm coming from Sterling Brown. And this is the poem that reminded me of your work. And so this is, I, I can hear Sterling Brown first, then I hear Ariel Dorfman. Well, this is called Olem. I talked to Olem, and Olem said, they wear the cotton, they store the corn, we only good enough to work the roads. They run the commissary, they keep the books. We gotta be grateful for being cheated. Whippersnapper clerks call us out of our name. We got to say Mr. the Spending Boys. They make our figures turn somersets. We buck in the middle, say, 
thank you, sir. They don't come by ones. They don't come by twos, but they come by tens. They got the judges, they got the lawyers, they got the jury rolls, they got the law. They don't come by ones. They got the sheriffs, they got the deputies, they don't come by twos. They got the shotguns, they got the rope, we get the justice in the end, and they come by tens. Their fists stay closed, their eyes look straight. Our hands stay open, our eyes must fall. They don't come by ones. They got the manhood, they got the courage. They don't come by twos. We got to slink around, hang tail hounds. They burn us when we dogs. They burn us when they we men. They come by tens. I had a buddy, six foot of a man. Muscle up perfect, game to the heart. They don't come by ones. Outworked and outfought any man or two men. They don't come by twos. He spoke out of the turn at the commissary. They gave him a day to get out of the county. He didn't take it. He said, come and get me. They came and got him. And he came by tens. He stayed in the county. He lays there dead. They don't come by ones. They don't come by twos. But they come by tens. Beautiful poem. I, I didn't know this poem. And, and that leads me into, you know, the, the know taking away of, 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 of uh, for me, that was Sterling. Sterling Brown is a great uh, African-American poet. I uh, taught for uh, over 40 years at Howard University. He was like the dean of African-American literature. Um, he's one of those writers who said, don't associate me with the Harlem Renaissance. You know, people, some people said, you know, I, I was not, you know, um, he didn't go down to the boat. He said he never got went down to the dock, actually. But he never was part of that. His work is completely different. Uh, his signature poem uh, is called Strong Men, which he would always end a reading with. Uh, one of the beautiful things I feel I was able to do, at least in my life, um, was to make him the Port Laureate of D.C. When, when I came here to Washington and was a student at Howard University, whenever Sterling Brown was introduced, he was introduced as the Port Laureate of D.C. But he wasn't. You know, it was not. You know, it wasn't official. You know, it was like you know you you know like if you're from Washington, it's Meridian Hill Park, but you say it's Malcolm X Park. But no, it's Meridian Hill downtown. Right. You know, and so what happens? One of the things, and maybe this happens in terms of revolution and social change. What happens? What you try to do is make it official. You know, and, and, and when I was an arts commissioner, you know, I was able to um, make Sterling Brown, along with the help of James Early and Grace Cavallari, the poet laureate of DC, and then took it another step, and this is how I, I'm, I define myself as a literary activist. If you go over to 1222 Kearney Street Northeast, there is a plaque outside of the house that says, this is the house of Sterling Brown and his wife, Daisy who put up with all of his lies and stories, you know. I want to make sure that, you know, just like how you read a poem to Angelica, yeah. you know, the, the poems are up here. You know, my wife is not here, but she drove me here, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I could be here this morning. Uh, um, but, you know, when I, I, I mentioned this poem by Sterling Brown because it was so important for me um, becoming a writer, uh, and then his poem led into your work, and when I talk about people being taken and missing and things of that sort, uh -huh. I felt it was connected. Well, it is connected. I mean, there's in, an incantation in what you just wrote, which is very related to the two poems you, you mentioned. And I, I think this is a way of connecting to what you just asked about the new language. We're going to keep on coming back to that. When we left Chile uh, in end of 1990, Angelica left before with, with, with our son and with my parents, and I, I, uh, I had been clandestine for a while, and then I, I, I had to seek refuge in the Argentine embassy, and it took a while. By the end of, of 73, we were there. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were, at the end of 73, we were, we were in Buenos Aires already, and then we were in, in, in Paris. And uh, what, what, one of the things that happened was one of the reasons why I felt that it, was, it, it made sense for me to leave was because I could write. And yet, for more than two years, I found myself paralyzed. It wasn't that I couldn't write sort of pamphlets and, and reports to the resistance, et cetera. I mean, I, I was the, the cultural and press head of the resistance in the world. Uh, that was my sort of my, my, my title. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I couldn't write what I really wanted to write. I couldn't write poetry. I couldn't write, I couldn't write 
the novels. I, there was, I, I was paralyzed literally. There was, and, the, and the problem was fundamentally one of language, which was that the language that we had been using during the Chilean Revolution had been extraordinary. And yet at the same time, this language had not been able to foresee or to foreclose the coup and the disaster that was happening. It's, it's almost as if, let's say, Vesuvius is erupting. And you're writing about the flower down there, fine. But you know, if you had just written about Vesuvius erupting, maybe the people would have evacuated Vesuvi uh, you know, Pompeii and they wouldn't be dead. And you had all these dead on your shoulders. And I was paralyzed. I was paralyzed. I simply didn't know how to write. In other words, I didn't know. I, the words wouldn't come. Uh, Someone, I think, in the, in, in the way that very many black poetry or Native American poetry at times took a long time to percolate, to mm -hmm. find the way, right? Mm -hmm. And very often, in fact, when they wrote, they weren't published. Right. They were discovered much later that those, those were the words that mattered, right? So while everybody around me was writing words of denunciation of mm -hmm. Pinochet, I felt that wasn't the way to go. I just, I mean, it's not because I wasn't for denouncing Pinochet. I'm, denouncing, I'm still denouncing Pinochet. I mean, it's a, it, I, I'm never going to stop that because he's personified something very special in that sense. But from the point of view of what literature needed to do, it needed to do something different. I felt I had no idea what that was because I didn't have the words or I didn't have the words, I mean, the shape of the words to do it. And in fact, the first poem that came to me was this one of two okay. times two. So let, let me just read this so that you can, you can realize what happened. And one day, you know, I, I woke up and, I mean, it, it, it's dos más dos. It's very, 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 very brief. It's very brief. Two times two. We all, the, we all know the number of steps, compañero, from the cell to that room. If it's 20, they're not taking you to the bathroom. If it's 45, they can't be taking you out for exercise. If you get past 80 and begin to stumble blindly up a staircase, Oh, if you get past 80, there's only one place they can take you. There's only one place. There's only one place. Now there's only one place left they can take you. So, again, I'm not going to try to explain the poem. Could you the read poem. the Last Will and Testament also? Last Will and Testament, yeah. Well, because this was, this was such a... Okay. I... The despair that's in that but the luminosity of having said it, mm -hmm. of going to, to the dead or the tortured and saying, I'm with you. I can imagine you at least. That's the least. At least you have this company of these words, even if you can't hear them. And you know what? The people who are in jail or disappeared, they can hear these words. They can hear the, I, they can hear the words. They can. It's really true. I, I'm speaking this just from the point of view of amnesty. The people said that, that when they had these campaigns for 10,000 letters, for such and such a political prisoner, he or she realized, generally he, you know, realized that there was a campaign because the guards changed the way they were doing it. Now, those letters, this is different. This has to do with the spirit, with the idea that you're not alone, compañero. You're not alone. Even if, even if you have to, what you write is not what you want to write. I don't want to write that. I want to write. You came out, out there and your wife was waiting for you. You kissed her and you saw the baby that you had never seen born. That's when I write, but it's not what happens. Mostly it's not what happens. So you have to go into the, the very dark despair of the moment in order to come out of it in some way. You, you can't, this is the major thing. You can't lie about these things, right. you know? And the left has got to learn these things. These are very important lessons because the triumphalism that we have very often doesn't allow us to see reality as it is. And one of the things that poets do and uh, dramatists do is they just lift the veil and they show certain truths which need to be looked at. Because if we don't do that, if we don't go through this process, then we're going to be so pure that we're going to be able to change the world or govern it when it's our turn to govern, you know? So, but as a response to that, because it was such a dark poem, I wrote this other one. A again, this came to me. Right. It came to me. It came like words that came to me saving me. Because it was, you know, all my life, I have answered death by writing. And to spend those first two years, you know, and Angelica was desperate watching me, so unhappy, not only because, you know, so many people were dying, so many things, terrible things were happening, but because I was unable to use the, the one instrument I had, which was this voice, mm. this talent that I was given, this blessing I was given, you know, 
to speak and, and, and to, to explore the situation. And this came of that. When they tell you I'm not a prisoner, don't believe them. I'll have to admit it someday. When they tell you they released me, don't believe them. I'll have to admit it's a lie someday. When they tell you I betrayed the party, don't believe them. They'll have to admit I was loyal someday. When they tell you I'm in France, don't believe them. Don't believe them when they show you my false ID, don't believe them. Don't believe them when they show you the photo of my body, don't believe them. Don't believe them when they tell you the moon is the moon if they tell you the moon is the moon that this is my voice on tape, that this is my signature on a confession. If they say a tree is a tree, don't believe them. Don't believe anything they tell you, anything they swear to, anything they show you, don't believe them. And finally, when that day comes, when they ask you to identify the body and you see me and a voice says, we killed him, the poor bastard died, he's dead when they tell you that I am completely, absolutely, definitely dead, don't believe them, don't believe them, don't believe them. So there's a sense there of, of giving a voice to this person, you know? And it, it's, it's my most famous poem. It's so famous that, it, that, that <laughs> when we, we go around Latin America, we find uh, posters that say, Testamento, and then it says, Mario Benedetti, which is terrific, because he's a much greater poet than I am, this Uruguayan, you know? I say, what better thing can I have? It's like they put Shakespeare underneath, you know? What you've written, great, you know? It doesn't belong to me anymore. Well, it's, I mean, it's still influenced people because I'm going to read this poem. It's definitely influenced by the, what that was. Well, we're going for poem. We're going right, 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 but, but this goes right back. It shows <laughs> right. you that, that if you hadn't written this, I would not have written this poem. Um, well, and, and, give and, me your hand. Brother. Okay, and this is <laughs> okay. called What Do They Do? What do torturers do when they return home? Do they make love to their wives and play with their kids? What hobbies? do they have? Do they wash the car and take out the trash? Do they change their underwear? What do torturers see when they look in the refrigerator? When shopping, do they go to the front of the line? Do they get discounts on meat? Do torturers remember their anniversaries? Do they place candles on birthday cakes and blow them out? When torturers go to church, who do they pray to? When they get caught in traffic jams, do they curse the cars in front of them? Do they worry when they get dirt and blood under their fingernails? What type of deodorant do they use? When torturers leave a room, do they turn out the lights? Are they superstitious? Do they avoid stepping on sidewalk cracks? Do they read their horoscopes before going to work? How many torturers have two jobs. When lost, do they ask strangers for directions? Are they left-handed or right-handed? Do torturers sit in outdoor cafes and talk about torture? Do they suffer memory loss? Do they call in sick and say they can't report for work? How safe is a torturer's workplace? When they fall to sleep, do they snore? Do torturers keep everyone awake at night? Beautiful. Oh, okay. so I, let me ask you about. Um, I, wait, I just want to tell you that I remember how moved I was when you sent me that poem. Remember, right, we, right. We, we, we exchanged emails right. about it, you know, and I, I, I really love the way you have humanized and at the same time how you are accusing. In which it's, you know, this is what I was speaking about in the relation. To, here, here is a poem which opens a world to us which we do not want to see. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, we need to see that, we need to see that world. We need to see, you know, that these are, the, the terrible thing is that they are human beings. Mm -hmm. We wish they weren't because it would be so easy if they weren't, right. you know? If our adversaries, right. these people were destroying the world and creating so much pain. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. I'm, gl I'm glad I wrote my poem. Now I'm, I'm doubly <laughs> glad I wrote that poem. <laughs> well, let me, let me quote you on something that you, that you wrote. Uh, and this gets you further into language. Um, and, and um, this is in your book, In Case of Fire in a Foreign Land, which you just wrote, read from. Um, you write in the beginning, this book is like a country of the future, a place I would like to inhabit. As bilingual as I am, the first collection of my work that offers my two languages, my Spanish and my English, my two loves, the chance to breathe side by side on paper as they breathe next to each other in my mind and in my life. 
you wrote that. Then I had this question. Yes. And it's this. Do you ever encounter a lover's quarrel between the two languages? What about the importance of silence in a relationship? Uh-huh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. I, I, I'm not going to pass on Angelica's that. Angelica's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, once in a while you say silence is not, is not bad. You know, we, 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 we have this, this, this ongoing conversation about this, and I, I can always quote one of my characters, you know. So she'll say, don't you agree that you always say that we have to drag up every last piece of the past? You know, I said... And I say, yes, Paulina says that, and then her husband says we can die from so much past, you know? So it's always good, to be a writer, you can always quote your own work and use it for, for different purposes. But, but here's, I mean, this is, it's, it's almost impossible for me in the time we have allotted even mm -hmm. to explain the complex relationship between my two languages because I'm not really bilingual. I, I speak and write two languages identically well in the sense that it's not as if I have one language and then I acquired another. I have two languages. For many years, I got rid of one language and only wanted, I only wanted one language. I mean, like so many people, I, I wanted to be, as a kid especially, and when you're young, you want to be one thing. And only later I realized that you want to be, to want to be many things that is very enriching, right? But the point about this is that for many years, the, the languages were quarreling. They were quarreling all the time, especially in the sense of, which do, I, which do I write first, right? Where do I, how, how do I write this poem? Do I write testament or last will and testament, right? So for a long time, I would just write one language and I have a translator who would translate this, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then because of history, because history ended up stranding us here after the Chilean transition to democracy, we felt that we weren't comfortable in Chile because there was no space for us with the way we lived and the way we, we wanted to live our life. And because of the writing that I was, I was writing was not welcome in my country, though I brought it with such generosity there, we ended up returning to the United States. But part of that was also because I could make a living or I hoped I could make a living with my English and with my Spanish as well. So uh, they have now come after many years to a sort of a truce, a, a, a living together, I, I, always speak of, I always speak of myself as, as, as the territory where they make love with one another. Mm -hmm. Because when I, I, the lover's quarrel is exactly the right, the right idea. The idea is that I am an adulterer of language. In other words, I, I have an adulterous relationship with these two, these two languages. Or they, are, they love each other now enough to allow me to speak like that. It's very different. People say that I have different gestures when I speak one language or the other. Today what I do is I write in whatever language comes to me, whatever language I feel I need to write with. For instance, the 9-11 piece that I wrote for the New York Times, mm -hmm. I wrote first in Spanish for El País. Something on, on Nelson Mandela that will be coming out when our great hero dies, I did for El País first and then I did it into English. But then I correct the English with the Spanish back and forth because when you're translating your own work, it's like you have a second reader. And what the reader does is mm -hmm. the, the, the second reader inside you has the chance of saying, wait a second, that's not quite working. Right. That, that work does, oh, I can do that. And we were just working with Angelica on, on a children's story where, we, where you know, I had written it in English, I put it into Spanish, I had to change the name of the characters because it had to do with a, a little bat. And the bat didn't work, so we had, I had to turn into a loro, which is a, a, a parrot. Well, let, me, in, let me add something here. Let me add something, because you're dealing with language. Um, when my father came to this country, he lost a language. He was speaking Spanish when he was in Panama. Uh -huh. When he came here, he lost a language. Okay? Consequently, in my house, yes. okay, we didn't hear the Spanish. Right. Okay? And I also write about how he could no longer read his birth certificate because it was all in Spanish. Uh -huh. I look at that loss of language, and you probably encounter a number of people who are now like that first or second generation here who have a Spanish name, but they can't speak Spanish. Right. And, and what happens there in terms of when they try to find their voice through literature? How do they reclaim the language? Well, the first thing is I don't think the language is really lost. Okay. In other words, I, I think that inside your father, the Spanish was there. I don't know whether it's true or not because you know, I didn't, never met him, but yeah. I would wager that the way he spoke English was not quite the way everybody spoke English. We definitely okay. we understood that when he was punishing us. We didn't okay. understand what he was saying. So that, that's why. Right. <laughs> when, 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 when he got angry, right? When he got angry, we when he got angry he, right. My so, mother didn't understand what he was saying. You see, no, 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 but what I mean is the English itself. <laughs> but we were punished. So, so yeah, so, so the, when I write Spanish, right. 
English is there shaping it. Mm -hmm. And when I write English, the English that I write, you know, my editors at, at the Times, the Washington Post, or the, the LA Times, or the Guardian, they say, this doesn't work. This, I say, no, leave it there. Please leave it. It's strange. They say, but that's not, it's not grammatically incorrect, but there's something which is limping in it. There's something which is not off. And I said, but you know what? Why do you accept from Salman Rushdie that he's going to change things, you know, from, from an Indian perspective? You don't accept that we're going to do it from a Latino perspective. We have the right to do this. Right. Let us change the language as we do it. It's not grammatically incorrect. And generally, they listen to me. Very often, they don't. You know, there's, there's, I, I had, The Nation just published something on Egypt mm -hmm. and Chile, now in this, this latest Asia. issue of it, you know. And I had, I had a, I had three hours of back and forth with Rowan Carey, who's the managing editor there, about one word, the word that, <laughs> and a comma. And I said, this is lyrical there. No, it isn't. Let's do this. I said, your copy editor is wrong. You know, this is the Spanish. You've got a lyrical. Back and forth. We finally reached an agreement on that. But what I mean by that is, is it's, it's not really lost. Yeah. Now, uh, on the other hand, uh, we need to become at least a bilingual nation at some point, mm -hmm. and we will become merely out of demographics. Now, it'll happen in 200 years. It's gonna happen in, in, in Latin America before it happened in the United States. Mm -hmm. So we might as well, you know, hurry, hurry this up, because it's gonna become that. And, and I wrote in the New York Times many, many years ago a, a little piece in which I ended with this, this insolent thing. I said, don't worry so much. It was about a bilingual nation, it's a bilingual nation, I said, uh, you're, you're not going to lose Shakespeare, you're just going to gain Cervantes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's true. Yeah. Let me um, ask you uh, another question. How much time are we doing? We're great. We're great, okay. I would uh, ask, though, if you could bring the microphone closer because we just have to Oh, call. okay. All right. <laughs> um, is it possible for society to move beyond metaphor? Uh, is it possible for the present to become so different from the past that we can no longer compare the two? Uh, I'm, go I'll, I'll go to, I'm going back right. to something that Susan Sontag mentioned during the AIDS epidemic, that AIDS was not like... Metaphor is illness, right, right, right exactly. exactly. Well, I mean, in one sense, of course, uh, the metaphors that a society tells itself or, or, or sh with which it shapes the way we dream and speak and, and, and live and love is entirely different. I mean, it, it, it changes from time to time, and, and, and the, the greatest of the poets tend to touch that, you know, and, and, and create a world in which we, that we inhabit. It makes that world clearer to us. Mm -hmm. In another sense, you know, there's always a possibility of, of speaking, uh, of understanding the past. I, I, I am not one who thinks that the past is impenetrable. You know, I really think that we read the Greeks or we read the Upanishads and there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot that lost in translation, that's lost in the translation of time, obviously. But there's a lot much more which is the residue and we're always doing this all mm -hmm. the time. We're, we're always reinterpreting the past, taking the words from the past and making them ours. Now, w by doing that, what we do is, of course, we tergiversamos, we, we, we twist the past into something different. At the same time, we rescue the past into something relevant. So it's, it's a process of going back and forth all the time in that sense. But I always think that something remains. And, and I, s I, I did this in a poem, which, which I, I don't want to read the whole poem, but it, the, the poem which opened this pro, uh, simultaneous translation mm -hmm. says that, that finally humanity, something is communicated. In spite of my river interpretations and turns of phrase, something is communicated, a part of a howl, a thicket of blood, some impossible tears. The human race has heard something and is moved. It's mm -hmm. about the tra simultaneous translation what, when you're in Geneva or in New York and you're translating in the Human Rights Commission about the terrible things that are mm -hmm. being said and you, you turn them into words. But something is heard. What the idea that we, we, you know, it's just like the language is not lost. You don't lose the language. You don't lose that. You don't, th th there's, there's a, a core of it which is transmitted. And that's what, otherwise the dead are really dead okay. forever. Yeah. You what, know? And, what and that, role, that's, that's intolerable right. for me. What role does Edith Grothman play? She's your translator. How do you, how no, but she's not my translator. <laughs> she, she translated <laughs> she's these She's not poems. your translator. No, no, okay, well, I mean, no, 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 what I mean poems. is, no, what okay. I mean she's is, in this book, she's right. Yeah, I mean, I had already translated some of the poems. So she didn't do anything. No, 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 no. By this, I, 
Well, and you say she's my translator. <laughs> okay. It's because I have so it's many. It's your book. I got no. <laughs> I'm just messing. No, no. You know what's ha you know what happens? I've got yeah. so many, right. so many languages, so many. This is my translator. Right. No, she translated the poems in this okay. book. Okay. Some of them, not okay. all. And how and how would and and were you correct and, here in places? And or? here here's what happened. I mean, I had already done some translations of my own of some of the poems because I needed to read them and you know th these were militant poems in the sense that they were poems to, to stir people about the situation in Chile. That wasn't the only reason I'd written them, but they, they moved people in ways which very often political discourse mm -hmm. would not do. When we decided with Viking to bring out the poems, we had already brought out uh, the novel, Last of the Manu Sanvita, we brought out some other things, we brought out in, in Pantheon uh, the novels and, and, and the essays of Empire's Old Clothes. Uh, when we decided to do this, then my editor then, Nan Graham, said, Ariel, I think you need somebody to translate this for you, right? And Edie Grossman, we had already met her. With Angelica, we had gone to New Jersey to a, a conference there, uh, literature, we had already met. And she had already been the translator of Cortázar and some other people that I liked very, very much. I liked her work. She had translated, uh, uh, not 100 years solid, but she translated the next Garcia Marquez novel. So she was a very accomplished, and her, her translation of, of Cervantes, the latest one, Don Quixote, is a really excellent, excellent, it's the best one I think that there is. It's very good in that sense. So when, when she began to, to, and she began to work on it, and what she did is she had a distance from okay. these poems, which allowed her to use them in a little bit more colloquial English. She said, I, I, I'm going to have to change them in a slight ways. But then she sent them to me, and I said, no, I disagree with this, I disagree with it, I disagree with that, you know? Recently, you know, uh, uh, the translator of, of uh, there, there's, there's a book which is about to come out next year called Poems That Make Grown Men Cry. And then there's going to be one that make grown women cry. <laughs> where they take a series of authors and ask them to choose the poem that makes them cry. You know, And I chose a poem by Quevedo, which has a lot to do with Ashes from Ashes. Mm -hmm. It has to do with, with uh, Ceniza serás, más ceniza enamorada. You will be ashes, but you will be ashes in love, Quevedo says, you know, speaking about, about love. In love beyond death. It's Amor Constante Mas Allá de la Muerte, it's called. And I had taken some translations that I found on the web, et cetera, and sent it to the people. In, 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 I think it was his, his Amnesty was doing this for some, some cause, or perhaps Penn International in, in, in London. And it turns out that they had two Spanish writers who were doing this. One was, me, was myself, and the other was Javier Marias, who was probably the most accomplished uh, novelist not maybe in the world today, but certainly in the Spanish language today, I would say. And he chose exactly the same poem for entirely <laughs> different reasons. <laughs> and his translator into, into English is Margaret Jewell Costa, who I've never met, you know. I, I admire the, the work that, that she right. does, you know. And, 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 and she had translated the poem of Quevedo perfectly, except for the last stanza. So I sent back to the people of Amnesty or Penn, I, I can't remember who, I said, look, they said, would you mind if we use this translation, which is much better than the ones you've sent us? And I said, I've got no problem with it. It's a really good translation. But the last line, the last line is not a line which makes m what I'm saying comprehensible. Mm -hmm. Ask her if she doesn't mind changing it to this. And then she sent a thing saying, thank you so much. It's a much better, you know? So it's a back and forth in that sense. Right. But to be bilingual. I'm totally bilingual at the same time. I'm only 99% bilingual. Mm -hmm. There's a part of me, for instance, it's the I, one I, percent that we have to look out. For. Yeah, you gotta, <laughs> you, you gotta make sure. You gotta make sure the one percent doesn't fuck up the rest, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> In all senses, right? right? Okay. This, yes. this, um, uh, when we were introduced, uh, and Angelique was mentioned that we both have two memoirs, and and I want to know how you made the transition um, from you know novel plays, poems, into the memoir. Um, for me, um, I only wrote a memoir, Fathering Words, because of a loss. I, I lost my brother, I lost my, my father. And I felt that in terms of poetry, um, the poetic line was not enough in terms of helping me express myself completely. So I had to father more words, and that's where the, the title comes from. Um, but then I wrote a second memoir in which I tell people, the first one, I was mapping my life you know, in terms of how I got from here to there. The second one was mining my life, where I went much deeper in terms of issues that were really bothering uh -huh. me. So I wonder in terms of when you look at the memoirs that you wrote, 
uh, why two? You know, I always tell people there's always a sequel to everything except Catwoman with Halle Berry, but that's something else. <laughs> but we both wrote two sequ you know, we both wrote two memoirs. I wonder why the second one. Well, let me just say the following about about how that was created in the sense that there were there were two memoirs. Originally, I was writing only one memoir, and there are there are. You do not choose the books. The books choose you. You know that very well. You know, no matter what you want to write about this, it turns out that if you don't want to, if, if it's not the right moment and you're not in the right place, you don't do it. And Angelica, who's very wise and smart, but very wise, said, you're going to go crazy. Don't do it. Or if you've got to do it, just know you're going to go crazy. And I literally, really, I mean, not literally, but I almost went crazy but for, for months because I could, I could not decide which language to write in. So one thing was for there to be a truce between Spanish and English. But when you're telling the story, hey, yo primero, no, me first, you know? So who goes? <laughs> one day I was so crazy that at 4 o'clock in the morning I began to write it in French, which I don't like. <laughs> I, I, I force it, my wife is here, she can, she can attest that this is totally true. You know, I'm not making these things up. I make up lots of things, but not this. So, so, so I realized two things. I realized, first of all, that this was not one memoir, but two, in, in the sense that one, the first, the first memoir, whatever I'm going to write, had to go from my birth or before my birth, my ancestors, etc., to the Chilean coup. The way I had to organize it, and I think this is, this is what makes the memoir special, is that it's organized around a present voice which is speaking, uh, speaking about the coup as if it's happening, and I'm on the run, and they're out to kill me, and I'm going from one place to another, to another, to another. And as I go, I'm losing Chile. Mm -hmm. I'm losing the sense I'm going towards exile, and there's nothing that can stop me, because history is pushing me savagely in that direction, right? Unless I'm going to get killed, right? And because I, I don't die at La Moneda, because I keep on going, because, because of all the things we're living, we're, we're, le we're leaving that country, you know? In the other, I'm gaining Chile. And it's in past. I'm looking past, and I'm looking at how that, that's going. So the very structure of it was what I was most interested in. And there's, you know, John Berger once told me, you know, the only thing that matters is the structure you're going to do, the, the, the shape you're going to put it. Because everybody's got stories to tell. How do you shape it? So I, was, I, was, I wanted to organize it in such a way that, that the reader himself and her, or herself was going to have to jump back and forth because that's the way we live our lives. We remember in a fractured way. We do not remember in a chronological way. You live your life chronologically, but your memoir is never chronological. It can be chronological, but generally it's, it's less interesting like that. Or it can be. But in my case, because my life was so was full of fissures and, and twists and turns and breakages and ruptures, I think it was fundamental to, 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 to organize it like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, if I don't write, and it ends with me suspending the air with Angelica and Rodrigo, our, our, our young son, uh, going from Buenos Aires, running from the death squads there, towards Peru, Havana, Europe. And that's right, I'm suspending the air on top of Latin America, and that's where I leave myself, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I knew that at some point, or maybe I would or maybe I wouldn't be able to continue this. One of the reasons why I realized I wanted to write that story there, why I wrote, wrote Heading South Looking North, you say about loss, is that it happened after the coup. I mean, I'm sorry, after the transition. And I realized that one of the things that was happening in the Chilean transition is that even many of the people who had fought for democracy in Chile, La Concertación, many of my own friends and allies, you know, were out to leave the past behind. Mm -hmm. So you, wouldn't, you would leave it there. And I realized that this was both, both a memoir and a testimonio. Mm -hmm. I was revindicating the story of Allende in particular and what it meant for Latin America. I will not allow, I will not allow, I mean, as far as I'm able, while I, while I can breathe my last. Just like Saul Landau used to say, I'm going to go to the Sheridan Circle. If nobody else goes, I'm going to go there. Mm -hmm. And he shamed lots of people who thought, you know, enough is enough. Mm -hmm. Well, the same thing. I mean, I am not ever going to betray the memory of Salvador Allende, mm -hmm. ever, ever, ever. Because, because he was a man who was opening up. He made terrible mistakes like, like all human beings do. He never made the mistake of betraying his people, betraying the poor people, of his, betraying the revolution, or betraying the idea of, of, of peace. He never betrayed that, you know? 
and I just will not, and I, I know, but the way in which you tell that story is not just, oh, Allende's so great. Right. You tell the story, and I was one of the first persons who said, yes, you know what, he did commit suicide. Now they, they continue to speak about, I think he did. And I think it's more interesting if he committed suicide than, than if they killed him, you know? So that was the, 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 the central thing behind that. Uh, then many years later, I felt the need to write this, the, 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 the second memoir, because there were things that I had left out, and I wasn't telling the truth about what exile had done to me and done to my family, and the incredible damage done especially to the woman I love. Mm -hmm. you know, very few critics have, have mentioned that, but you know, when you say your wife drove you here, well, you know, Angelica drove me here, and not only she drove me here, she, she carried me here, not here, she carried me. And this is a very important thing to say, and they're, they're, they're always left out. The women are left out. They, 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 they were part of this, and they, were, they, they committed tremendous sacrifices, you know? I'm up here, and she's down there. She's up here, too, you know, in, the, in that sense. Mm -hmm. No, but it's, it's, it's important to say those things. That's where ashes from ashes. Yeah. So what was, what was the, the, the triggering political event of the second memoir? It was Sarajevo. And it was the sense that here was a city that was being disputed and destroyed by outside forces of people who had lived peaceably next to each other for many, many years. And it was done through the, the horror of fundamentalism in our times, of all sorts, from the right, from the left, from religion, from all these forms that, that, are, that are only pure. And I said, you know what? It turns out that I was a fundamentalist myself of language. I wanted only to speak Spanish or only to speak English. I wanted to be only one thing. And we need a world where we can understand how complex things are. Complex, but finally, if your moral compass is, it, 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 it could be complex, the world, but the actions you have to take are not that complex, finally, about how, how to fight injustice, you know? And we have to separate those things. We have to, in fact, combine both things. So I thought to myself, I need to write something in which I tell the story of how I came to be a person who only wanted to live in Chile and ended up in the United States, who only wanted to speak Spanish and ended up speaking Spanish and English, who only thought of one thing in relation to revolution and now thinks in so many different ways about revolution, you know? Who thought only one thing about love and now understands love to be in a very different way. I had to confess that. And I'll tell you something. If I have the chance to do it, there is a third one, which mm -hmm. I will do what you did in your second one. Mm -hmm. Because I will map out, having mapped out the story, meaning, the trajectory of it, the public persona. There's a lots of private things, some of which I can tell, some of things I can never tell. You know, that, that's very important that, that, that we have to keep our secrets to ourselves. But, you, but you're from Chile, and, and when I bring in the second one, I talk about mining and, and, and what happens, the whole thing of bringing things to light. Also, many times with mining, you know you need assistance you know, to gather you, to, to bring you up. But the whole thing of bringing something secrets, bringing things to light, I felt for a second memoir was a big challenge for me. It's a term, tremendous. Right. Again, I was, uh, it's like right. going crazy. I'm going to read a short extra. Please. Uh, you mentioned about the women sometimes being left out. Um, because I was the baby of the family, um, I was left out of a lot of things. <laughs> and as I always tell people, I thought my name was shh, you know, because when they say, you, know, <laughs> you thought your name was shh. Yeah, yeah, they see you at the door, like, shh, you know, you know, so here, you know. So I, I, I thought that that was, that was my name. But um, because I was a baby of the family, there was a lot of the family stories they didn't know. So um, in um, Fathering Words, I, I created my, my sister's, sister's voice. But here's uh, just two ex short excerpts from the memoir. This is how it begins. The day after my brother died, Carmen, one of his neighbors, said she saw him walking his dog. My brother Richard, who had changed his name to Francis, loved animals, and so he took the name of the saint he loved. Growing up in the South Bronx, it was important to believe in something, and so my brother made the decision to believe in God. I met God one afternoon on Longwood Avenue in the Bronx. It must have been around 1958, and I was attending PS39, which was located near streets like Beck, Kelly, and Fox. Longwood Avenue was the big street, and I was not permitted to cross it alone. I was in one of those grades in school where you took naps and the teachers gave you cookies when you were good. On the day I met God, I had been standing on the corner for almost an hour, afraid to cross Longwood Avenue. All my school friends were gone, and I was alone with cars passing by and the dark evening creeping in like one of my sister's boyhood lovers. I was afraid to cross the street without holding someone's hand. And so I did something my brother was good at doing. I started praying to God. 
I asked God to come for me, to help me cross the big street. If he did, I promised I would be good for the rest of my life. I would never steal or lie. I closed my eyes and only opened them when I heard my father running across the street, cursing and trying to fix his clothes at the same time. When I was little, I thought my father was God. And, um, and this is how I create my sister's voice. This is my sister's voice, just an excerpt. When they brought the baby home, I was so excited. I pushed Richard out of the way. I remember her, you, holding Eugene for the first time. He was smaller than some of my dolls. I thought he would break. My mother thought I was silly. My name is Marie. I was named after my grandmother. I was the bald-headed child. My father often refused to take me out in the stroller if my head was not covered. He could not believe it, it could be born, a girl could be born without any hair. I must have been five or six before my mother could hold something in her hands and make a braid. The reason I had no hair is because I was yet to be trusted with the family stories. I was not wise enough to understand why people acted the way they did, especially men. My mother would have to teach me these things along with cooking, cleaning, and dressing myself. My hair would grow with each story I learned to remember. Now that I'm over 50 years old, my hair is long and beautiful. There are places where it has turned gray, and here I find myself wanting to forget my memory. Very beautiful. Thank you. So those were the things, not leaving, not leaving the women out. Do we have time? Are we going to take questions and stuff? Or? Yeah, I mean, as you long, as, long as I have a chance to read one more thing, then... Uh, okay. <coughs> How much time do we have? Yeah, okay. Okay. Is this, is this yeah, I mean, th this is a longer poem. It, here's, here's, here's just one thing I, I, I want to explain that. So, how does a poet react when something that is fills him or her with indignation about the present? I mean, how do you react in that sense? Because it's very good to say we should write love poems, but at the same time, there are things like torture, and you 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 react in that way. And a great part of my my life has been. Uh, divided, not divided, but it, it's related to the fact that the, the politics are always there for me, you know, because I, 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 I'm, it's very clear to me that, that you need to be able to, to engage with the, the pain of the world and w which, what is happening in the world. So you have, to be, you have to be a public poet in that sense, the same thing with a private poet. So it turns out that, that uh, when the war of Iraq was coming, when Bush was about to invade, uh, I had been working on uh, a play about Pablo Picasso, which I opened here, in mm. fact, at, at Theater J, yeah, right? Yeah, about yeah. Pablo, uh, Picasso's closet, right? And so I wrote a poem. It came to me uh, when Colin Powell went to the UN and he took Guernica and he, he, he had it covered so that it wouldn't be behind him while he was justifying the invasion of Iraq, right? Because it was the poem, it was the, it was the, Guernica itself was, of course, telling everybody that this is what he was going to do in Iraq, right? So, so uh, I've always been obsessed by the dead speaking, always, always. I mean, I, I spoke about this before in that sense, and, and you saw how some of the right. poems are related to that. And not to let the dead die is a way of keeping ourselves alive, too, because, you know, very soon, very soon, most of us here are going to be gone. So. If we, if we, it's out of self-preservation that if we don't <laughs> allow the dead to speak to us and, and carry them in some sense, you know, carry them like ch children, then we're, we're refusing to let ourselves be carried as well, right? And I've always been obsessed by this, and, and I came up with a, a poem called Pablo Picasso has some words for Colin Powell from the other side of death. <laughs> and, it was, and then it was turned into, I'm not going to read. You know the connection here? When I made reference to PS39, yes. that's the same school we went, he went to. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I know, I know, I know. And then, then, uh, and then I wrote the poem which I'm going to read. It's about Christopher Columbus. And then I wrote a poem called Hammurabi, the exalted prince who made great the name of Babylon. It has some words from the other side of death for Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> which begins with the words, I do not want to curse you. I do not want to curse you, you know? This is the curse. And then I wrote something called William Blake has words from the other side of death for Laura Bush, lover of literature, <laughs> in memoriam Francisco Petrarca, right? And then, much, much later, I had, a, I had a poem called Salvador Allende has words for Barack Obama from the other side of death. 
telling him, stand up, Barak, stand up, young Barak, stand up. Even if you're gonna, either you're gonna fail, you must fail fighting, standing. standing. But it's not only that, but it was all about his own thing, about la moneda, etc. Anyway. But the one I most like is this one, which is Christopher Columbus. Well, I'm going to read it only in English because it's a long poem. But Angelica said, don't read a long poem, but I, I've got to read this because I, I, I want you to, to see, <laughs> I want you to see how, how the epic, how, how you can create a sort of an epic poem of our times mm -hmm. in a way which combines Latin America, Iraq, United States, everything. So Christopher Columbus has words from the other side of death for Captain John White. W-H-Y-T-E, I swear this is true, who rebaptized Saddam International Airport as his troops rolled in. This happened. I read it. I said, I can't believe this guy's called John White. <laughs> and he said, and this is what Christopher Columbus said. They come to me. Christopher Columbus said, I know something about names, Captain. Those who conquer must always have a name ready, even before the sword, before the gun. I saw the island and called it San Salvador. San Salvador, because we, were, we had been saved. I did not ask the natives. They were friendly, they were almost naked, they were brown under the tropical sun. I did not ask them what they called that place themselves. I did not ask them what they called their home. Remember this is Christopher Columbus speaking, right? And I did not tell them that they would all die. I did not tell them that nobody would ever know what they spoke, how they spoke. The words would be swallowed like boats are swallowed in the tempest of a sad sea, like bodies are swallowed in the mine. Now they teach me their words and their songs here in the dark of forever. I study what they call the moon and love and goodbye. I, love, I listen to their carib whispers, and I purse my lips, and I whistle, and I soften the air with a language no one has spoken on that island for over 500 years. This is my penance. And then Quechua, and then Maya, and then Sotzil, and then the thousand and ten tongues that were once alive in the lands that would not be called my name, that would be called by someone else's name, Amerigo, America. And then learning will go on, Navajo and Guarani and Nahuatl, and the sounds that once filled the ears of lovely maidens to bring forth the crops, and no one today even knows their name, learning, learning, until they have taught me to pronounce each last words. How do you say friend? How do you say death? How do you say forever? How do you say penance? They will teach me how they say penance in their thousand and ten tongues. Your penance, Captain, what awaits you? You said you came to bring freedom. Freedom, when another can decide for himself. You said you came to bring democracy. Democracy, when another can control for herself. You said you came with liberation. Liberation, when the people who made the world name that world and themselves. Freedom, democracy, liberation, words your words, the words of your leaders. And then you call the airport by another name. It is ours, we took it, we're here. We killed the men who called it by that other name. We can call it now what we will. Under a sky full of bombs, another name. Baghdad now, not Saddam. Saddam Airport, not a name I like. We like here on the other side. A name cursed in the cellars, where the fingers are crushed, where the head is split, where the teeth are pulled, rooted out. The roots of that name, Saddam, the striker of the blow, the one who resists, the one who gives grief, the one who prohibits, all, all crying out inside that name. But not for you, Captain, to change, not for you to decide. Your penance? They wait for you, John White, here in the glorious dust of words, they once scrolled on paper, parchment, stone. Here in the dark light of death, they wait for you, the poets of Iraq. Abu Nawas and Sadi, Mutanabi and Buturi, waiting like the rugs they used to sit on, waiting, waiting like the founts they used to drink from. All the words you did not think to use, Captain John White, all the names you did not know, not even your, known, your own, White, 
Baraka. Baraka, related to Barak, blessing. You will have to learn, pronounce as I have had to pronounce, word for word. The Arabic you did not care to know, like the Nata'awatal I never knew, like the Cherokee I never knew. You will have to learn, starting with a hundred words that pour forth from Allah, Rahman the Compassionate, Rahim the Merciful, Rahman International Airport, Rahim International Airport. Can you hear them even now as you advance towards Baghdad? Can you hear their voices? Rahman the Compassionate, Rahim the Merciful, Rahman, Rahim, and Salam, Salam, peace. One of the attributes of God. Your penance, John White, John Baraka. Did you never think they will treat you with mercy on the other side? That the people of Iraq might want to call their land with the names of Salam, the many names of peace. Your penance, O oh white one, it will take you and your leaders forever and forever and forever. It will take you forever to learn the word for peace. Mm. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. my favorite really is the William Blake one because it uses all the verses of Blake and all the verses of Petrarca to mm -hmm. speak to Laura Bush, who should have known better. <laughs> so she could. The idea was that she should fuck war out of Bush. <laughs> she didn't manage it, but this was what it was about. You know. <laughs> Angelique. Okay, Angelique. Thank you. On that note, um, I <laughs> Well, I like Saul did the sexual revolution yesterday, I, and I came right after. They aren't just singers that let this know there. So, why is it that ha we don't we have great protest singers today? But why is it that they're not known why, to everybody? Why everybody on the left even isn't memorizing those lyrics and finding some of those songs turning into anthems? Um, why is that? And what can be done to make that happen? Because that can be one of the, be the most the most powerful instruments for making people join us. One more. Okay. Hi. Um, I'm Nancy Cohn from Boston, and I, I write a lot. I, every month, I write a heartfelt letter to President Obama to ask him to free the Cuban Five, and it's amazing how much creative energy I try to put into that, even though the chances of his ever reading it are slim to none. But um, Saul was one of the people, and a lot of people have told me that I really have a book in me and I need to take seriously my writing and figure out how to do a book. And I kind of heard your warning early on about avoiding triumphal, I can't even say the word. Triumph Triumphalism, I said. Triumphalism. Triumphalism. Okay. I mean, it's come from Spanish, triumphalismo, so I just I need, it. Yeah, I need to understand more of that and also about <laughs> whether your thoughts on not starting with the truth, but as you, as you develop the story, the truth kind of is discovered, and whether that applies to writing a memoir too. I just hmm. kind of, I'm feeling like I'm about to step off and really begin this process, and I just am looking for some guidance on, on how you do that uh -huh. from the heart. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I, I'll try to answer. Um, a number of these questions very easily. Uh, I think that um, one, in terms of trying to change um, language, and this is something I, I follow in terms of, of how to get Obama to say something different. I, I look at how words move through uh, uh, in terms of vocabulary. Um, so if you look at one word I think is going to come back, it's, it's backlash. I think you're going to see that come into a, 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 our, our vocabulary. Uh, some of this comes through the media. Uh, I think the right is very good in terms of defining things, you know, and, 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 and labeling things so they stick. Uh, I feel, for example, uh, they were very successful in terms of, of putting a failed presidency label on Jimmy Carter. You know, uh, I think they're going to begin to put a failed label on, a, on, on Obama. Uh, I know they put a label on Ronald Reagan because when I was growing up and somebody said, well, who's the famous president or something like that, you know. <laughs> you know, you say like George Ward Lincoln, you know, Reagan. As soon as I saw like Reagan's name being on airports and things of that sort, I knew that that language was being used in a very effective way and in a very uh, sinister way at time. Now, in terms of the, the, the Emily's question about the left, I think one of the things that happens here 
Uh, and this is a problem on the left. Um, and I could go back to something that Jamie Raskin said about the Constitution the other day. We need to claim American history. You know, uh, we need to be able to, to communicate with people in Kentucky and, 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 and NASCAR races, whatever. You know, what happens is that we seem to be a little out of tune. I remember, for example, when I was dealing with many people who were progressive, you know, if I was from the Soviet Union, I could identify what they were saying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, because their references were like from Russia or something like that. You know, and, and that's why sometimes, you know, when you were trying to organize the African American community, you know, you would say, well, I'm with a such and such party. And, and somebody said, well, I like the party, but what kind of party are you having? You Know, and, and you would speak, you know, uh, in such a way, or you had your progressive newspapers, and it didn't have a sports page, and so, so when you, so when you talk about like Woody Guthrie and people like that, well, yeah, I, you can sing those songs, okay, and, and those are songs that came out of people's lives, and so people identify with it. Uh, the other thing I think what happens now, and, I, and I'm even guilty of that, some of the, the songs, especially in terms of like labor songs, were never really passed down, you know, uh, and so there's a there's a real gap that's there, you know. I think there's a few civil rights songs that have survived, and that's my, I think, might give a lot of credit to Bernice Reagan and then Sweet Honey the Rock, keeping some of those songs in the, in the public view. We also need um, singers, and, and some of these guys, singers are some of the country western singers, you know, who are political, you know, um, that they function that way. Bruce Springsteen's a person, for example. You know, I think what happens is that he's, you know, working class. People identify with the songs, and, and then he's progressive, you know, politically. And so you're looking for that type of person, uh, and 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 that has a lot to do with them being in sync with with the the country. You know, I mean, some of us, for example, are, are progressive, but we have a hard time seeing ourselves as patriots. So the Tea Party captures and steals patriotism. You see, and, and, and the left has to reclaim patriotism. And that's why I was happy to hear Jimmy Raskin talking about the Constitution. Yeah, this is our Constitution, you see, and, and, and we don't claim that. And then we try to go out and organize people. And I go back to the sports, I'm a sports guy. When people say, yeah, we gotta organize the workers. After like the weekend, the workers wanna talk about who won the game. <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? And so you have to understand that type of language, okay? And you have to have songs that people you know, the average person, you know, not the person that, that might be in this room, the average person who's just like, I don't have any politics, but I, I, I like the game and I like the music and I like the lyrics that you're saying because it makes me feel proud. If you're out of sync with that or your politics comes from abroad somewhere, it's not going to grab, you know, and, and that gets back to the language thing. Yeah, I, I, I want to take the last question first and then go to the other two which are in some way related. And I just want to say that, that uh, in anything you write, truth needs to be discovered. If you know it ahead of time, you're going to write a, probably a boring book. Because if you're not interested in finding out what's going to happen, it's like, you know who the murderer is, and why should I go on, you know? So, you, you and the, the, the first murder mystery of all time is Oedipus, where he, he's, he's, he's trying to find out who the murderer is, and it's himself, right? And I think that has to do with the metaphor of, 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 of language as well. So. Good luck on that. I can't give you other, uh, a, a, any luck. advice except that what you probably need most for, for writing is guts. Just guts to, to really, really, really get to that and say, you know, I don't know what the answer is, and I'm going to find it out by writing this and being, there's a word in Spanish, descarnado or descarnada, meaning take all your skin, take the skin off and just show the meat there, show the flesh and, and, and bone. Right, and bone, yeah. So I just want to say, it's interesting that this whole meeting of ours is called Ideas Into Action, right? And I got nothing wrong with Ideas Into Action, but notice that it's not poetry into action, it's not metaphors into action, it's not emotions into action, it's not words into action, it's ideas into action. And I'm just saying, that is an indication of the fact that we think that if you have the right idea, people are automatically going to agree with you, but it turns out that the, the idea itself may not be enough and that a good song might be able to move people more. But of course, when they're moved, you better have the ideas of what you want to do with that movement, right? right? right. So one of the things that happened during the Allende Revolution, one of the very interesting experiences that, that we used to have was, you would have the Kirapayun or Inti Imani or Victor Jara, and they would, they would sing before the speeches, and people were much more interested and moved by what they were singing than even by what Allende was saying or, or the politicians were saying, right? There was a divide there, and the divide continues in some sense. And it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. One of the nice things I like about Obama is he really is a poet. When he's allowed himself to speak in that way, it's extraordinary, his ability to use those words, right? 
Now, whether that reaches or doesn't reach people, I don't know. I, I certainly think it's the most admirable quality that he's got. But uh, relating to that, uh, when you say about poetry, it's strange. You speak about Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, right? And then Violeta Parra, Victor Jara. The point you, you said about it comes out of people's lives. Well, it turns out that, that Violeta Parra and Victor Jara and the whole new, new song movement, and the, what came, it came out of Argentina as well, Atahualpa Yupanqui, and it came out of the, the rancheras, and there's a whole tradition. It comes out of the struggle of the Latin American people, in the case of Chile particularly. I mean, they weren't born like out of the, out of the, the like Athena out of the head of Zeus. Okay. Jesus. It wasn't like that. It didn't happen like that. It comes out of people who have lived the lives of everyday people and find a way of speaking, and, and they combine from different places. They're close to the land. They're, they're, clo they're close to the land that is our land, and this is my land, right? So uh, I think that, that we're, we're, we're confronting a new era of technology, communication, which we have not sufficiently worked on. You know, it, 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 there's, there's sort of the idea, the idea of if you're political, you send the message via Western Union. Remember that, that, that long thing, you know? And we're still in, in, in the suggestion that what we write is political, and if you write something which is bland and, and about everyday life and, and which isn't questioning the status quo at all, that's not political. That is even more political than, than ours is, right? So it's up to us in the arts to do this, but it's up to people as well. I mean, it's people to transmit it and people to, we're, we're all, not all of us are, are the same sort of poets, right? Otherwise, all of you would be up here and I'd be down there, right, with, with, with Ethelbert. So it's not that it's, it's automatic. But there is a sense that a mass movement, a real mass movement, will call into being a series of poets, musicians, artists, in, in an extraordinary way. Now, we're no longer living that era. It's very strange. This is a depression era, but it hasn't got the depression artists. And it seems like it, 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 it's not happening quite in the way it, it needs to be happening. For instance, you know, this thing about, this, 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 this thing about Christopher Columbus, mm -hmm. uh, I love it, you know, but I love it returning to a cantata. The, the, somebody told the Pablo Picasso thing into a cantata, a, a German composer. Mm -hmm. it, you reach more people that way. I've just written, I, I've gone into opera lately. I've just written an opera called Nachiketa, which is taken from the Upanishads. It takes a little boy who goes down to, to death, he's supposed to die, and he, he's, he asks death three questions and is taken by death to see the worlds of the child prostitutes, the children soldiers, and the children of the disappeared, you know? It's a very political, and at the same time, you know, it's, and then I've written a musical, which is an ecological musical about a forest that's about to cut down. It's very difficult to get these things put on. They say, no, we don't want politics. You know, people, people want to speak yeah. about the sports page, you know? Yeah. But the fact is, we don't, know, we don't know who we're writing for. We at least have to, I know that I have to continue writing what I, what I need to write, because if I don't write that thing, who else will do it? Mm -hmm. And if nobody's listening, then nobody's listening, and then somebody, maybe, they, maybe someday they will, you know? I think that yesterday, one of the extraordinary things they, 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 they spoke about when they, they, they spoke about the fact that Remember that quote, you cannot complete the task, but you need to do your little bit. Mm -hmm. You cannot complete the task. We can't complete the task. So we are as strong as the movement that propels us, you know? And we will as isolated as the movement dissolves around us. And it's, it's rel relatively despairing in some senses, but if you believe that what you're saying is true enough and complex enough and beautiful enough and undeath enough that it will prevail in some way. I may be totally wrong, I probably am wrong, but I'd rather be wrong than be right. I'd rather be wrong about this in the sense I think that those words will remain in some way, just like I really believe that those people who you're writing about 
they're listening in some way. The dead are listening. They're asking us. They're demanding of, of us. And John Berger, the, the, who, who got money from the Transnational Institute, right? Big Earth, right? We never forget that. What, what an extraordinary amount of great work has been done and helped by this institute and by the people who, who, who founded it, right? He says, no, it's really true. It's really true. He says in Big Earth, he says, the dead will, the dead will, will, uh, will rest when the living understand how much they have suffered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. And I, I didn't say it. Yeah. He said it, okay. Right. So it's, it's it no, might be a good no place to make a good, good way for us to stop. It. Okay, thank you. And thank okay. you, Yeah, thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Ethelbert. Um, this would be the end of our, our session today. Thank you. Um, thank you all for joining. Thank you. Um, thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Jessica. What a nice conversation. Wonderful. 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 Wonder